If you've watched a cartoon in the past decade or so, you've probably seen this, or this, or even this, and thought, what's with all these shows looking similar with all these bean heads and mouths? Well, you've just found yourself in the middle of an animation art movement. Many refer to this art movement as the Cal Art style, but I find that name useless, mainly because it was initially used by John Kay to describe how artists that came out of Cal Arts in the 90s had a very Disney influenced style. See the Iron Giant. How this was attributed to cartoons in the 2010s is beyond me. Generally, I prefer to call it the Bean Mouth style. So, for the purposes of this video, what is the Bean Mouth style? It is an art movement that emerged in the 2010s, characterized by using simple rounded shapes for describing character anatomy, like using tubes and ovals for describing limbs, and more infamously using a bean shape for a lot of characters' heads. It's a very efficient style that lets characters squash, stretch, and smear without too much trouble. In the right hands, it can be used to make crisp animation that flows well, and can be used to push expressions further than more naturalistic styles. However, when handled poorly, this style can seem flat, unfitting, or just plain unremarkable. This tier list is focused on how each show fits into this particular art movement in animation. That said, there are some shows from this era that I don't consider part of this movement. Generally, most modern adult animation isn't this style, as they tend to be influenced by other adult animated shows, most of which are either Family Guy, Rick and Morty, or are the creator's personal style. Also, the 2017 She-Ra is not this style either, as it draws from anime and drawing styles that were prevalent in Tumblr at the time. Hell of a Boss, Has Been Hotel, and Zoophobia will not be appearing in this list either, and I have no idea why anyone would associate it with this movement aside from lumping it into the modern show bad argument, but I digress. Let's start off with the formative works of this art movement. The first two shows that are considered to be patient zero of the Bean Mouth style are Chowder and The Marvelous Misadventures of Flapjack both of which were released in 2010, mere months apart of each other on Cartoon Network. Chowder was created by C.H. Greenblatt, who attended the University of Texas at Austin, while Flapjack was created by Thurup Van Orman, who actually did attend Cal Arts. A lot of the people who would go on to work on other iconic shows of this era also wound up working on these. Flapjack is a particularly interesting case given how desaturated it is compared to its successors. Chowder is a bit more in line with the shows that would follow it, save for its frequent use of unmoving patterns in clothes, and occasionally dipping into other animation techniques for certain jokes, though a more exaggerated case of the latter part would be used in a certain show in a different section. The most prolific show among this tier without a doubt, is Adventure Time, another 2010 Cartoon Network show created by Pendleton Ward, who also attended CalArts. A lot of future showrunners worked on Adventure Time, and a lot of the broader aspects of Adventure Time get carried over into other shows, like how the show looks all bright and cheery, but once you start delving into the deep lore, you find that some crazy shit happened in this world. Speaking of colors, this show's bright, primary focus palette and character construction would define a lot of its successors. That said, there are certain visual elements of Adventure Time that are unique to its creator shows, mainly how most of the characters have button eyes and fully rounded heads without the signature bean-shaped shorthand that a lot of shows would use later on, because that's really more of a chowder thing once you look at it. Nonetheless, Adventure Time was a very big show in the early 2010s, and its success is one of the big reasons why this overall art movement took off. Another Cartoon Network original that began at this point was Regular Show by J.G. Quintel, who also was a CalArts alumna. Regular Show, while initially a pitch to Adult Swim, wound up running on Cartoon Network itself, while also skewing towards a TV PG audience instead of the usual TVY7 that other shows did. 
Its style also did seem to take a bit more from other adult animators like Matt Gronig and Mike Judge, which gave it a particularly unique style that really hasn't been seen in a lot of other works in this art movement. All but one of these formative shows were created by CalArts alumni. After all, that school does have one of the oldest traditional animation programs in the nation. A lot of show creators from the past also went there and had different styles, mainly because a person's art style is shaped by the works that they grew up with and liked, while a TV show's style can also be influenced by the styles that the executives liked. That said, one of the most iconic shows that solidified this style was made by somebody who didn't attend that school at all. Steven Universe is probably one of the most prolific shows using the bean mouth style. It was created by Rebecca Sugar, who went to the School of Visual Arts in New York, and also worked on Adventure Time as a storyboard revisionist before getting promoted to a full-on storyboard artist. The show aired in November of 2013, not long after the pilot was aired in May of the same year. That said, it's obvious that there was quite a long time in between the initial pilot and the show itself. The pilot style was a lot more like Rebecca's natural style. However, she would work with the show's lead character designer, Danny Hines, and the co-executive producer, Ian Jones Cordy, to refine the character designs into what they are now. While simplified, the designs are oriented around conveying the character's personality through visual elements. Also, looking through Rebecca's concept art, she brings a level of anatomy that won't be seen for a little bit longer in these shows. That said, one of the most striking aspects of Steven Universe's visual style is the background art, especially the work of the lead background designer, Steven Sugar. Yes, that's his name, and yes, his sister did base the main character off of him. Gravity Falls was another big show that really cemented this style. It was a 2012 Disney Channel original created by Alex Hirsch, another CalArts alumni who worked on Flapjack as a storyboard artist. The character designs are a lot more cartoony than in Steven Universe, especially the main duo Mabel and Dipper. Their heads are particularly peanut-shaped, and their limbs are more noodly like Flapjack in Adventure Time. The background art has three modes, standard earthy cartoon, nostalgic nature shots, and moody horror, which is where Gravity Falls excels. Unfortunately, it only got two seasons, partially because of Alex wanting to end it on his terms, and partially due to the Disney XD curse, which might be worth a video all of its own. Star vs. the Forces of Evil was a Disney Channel original that came out in 2015, created by Darren Nefsey. If I were to describe the style of this show, I would say that it's the point where this art movement went from an art style that allowed for interesting functional designs to an art style trademark. A lot of the more human characters have very similar features, especially the main two. While Gravity Falls had a good reason to give Dipper and Mabel nearly the same body type, you know, because they're twins, why not have the characters from Muni be more cartoony and saturated, while the humans on Earth are less cartoony and desaturated? Oh, don't worry, we'll, we'll, we'll get to you, Centaur World. Don't worry, you're later on. These are the shows that just kind of showed up to the party with their art styles. They didn't make much impact in the long run, regardless of how good or bad the show was. I've only seen a handful of these shows, and that is due to the sheer quantity of entries in this part of the list. Which means we're going to have to make this a lightning round. Clarence was a 2014 Cartoon Network show by Skylar Page. I've seen it maybe once or twice. Supposedly, it was actually good, but not too many people were fond of it. I know I really wasn't because of how mundane it looked. At least the character designs were very different from each other, so they're making use of Rebecca's Bauhaus ideas one way or another. Atomic Puppet was a 2016 Teletoon show created by Mark Drop and Jerry Leibowitz. Never heard of it till I looked it up on this list. Kind of leans towards the Neo HD style. Uh, most of the states haven't heard of it because it was aired on Disney XD. 
boy, girl, dog, cat, mouse, cheese, a BBC show that aired in 2019. It's an unimpactful take on the style with an equally uninteresting show premise. Apparently it's getting a second season, so they must have done at least something well. Big City Greens is another Disney Channel show that premiered in 2018, created by the Houston Brothers. Art-wise, it's kind of like they took this style and added a dash of Simpsons into it, mainly with how the main characters aren't human skin tones. I've only seen some clips of it, but from what I saw, the writing's pretty good and it seems to have a dedicated fan base. Counterfeit Cats, a 2016 British-Canadian animated series that was a collaboration between Hardman and Atomic Cartoons that was yeeted into Disney XD to die after one season. Craig of the Creek, a Cartoon Network original that was made in 2018 by Matt Burnett and Ben Levin, who were head writers on Steven Universe. I've seen some episodes before and it was pretty good, it simply needed a little something more to its art direction to really get some more eyes on it. Cupcake and Dino General Services, a 2018 Brazilian Canadian animated series that aired on Netflix and Teletoon, lasted two seasons. Hero Elementary, a 2020 PBS show, never seen it, looks unremarkable. Nate is Late, a 2018 French-Australian cartoon that I didn't know existed until I started researching this topic. Oswaldo, a Brazilian-India cartoon by Pedro Ebolai. Slight variation on the style, but nothing notable. Ollie's Pack, a 2020 Canadian cartoon, but it's also by Pedro Ebolai. I will admit the rounded box head shape is a bit of a reprieve. Pity it was uniformly applied to the main cast. Seven Dwarves, a 2014 Disney XD original that died to the two-season curse. It's Pony, a 2020 British TV series made for Nickelodeon. It's a little different, but the overall art direction doesn't make it stand out. Pinky Malinky, honestly the production pinball this show went through was a lot more interesting than the final product. It started as a Cartoon Network pilot from the Cartoon Network Development Studios Europe, then it was greenlit by Nickelodeon in 2015 before getting booted to Netflix where it was finally aired in 2019. Trick Moon was an 8 minute pilot aired on Cartoon Network in 2019, created by Geneva Hodgson who was a storyboard artist on OKKO. If there was ever a precedent for drawing furries in this style, Trick Moon would be the go-to for it. It takes the already Fleischer influenced method of character construction and pairs it with a design philosophy that would be best described as Diet Sonic. Coupled with how much the pilot takes from OKKO's OK tone, the show doesn't have that much of an identity in both its visuals and its writing. A rare example of this style being used in adult animation is Camp Camp, a web series from Rooster Teeth that aired in 2016. It looks like your average example of this style with a few minor tweaks, and for good reason since it's going for that cute looking show says curse words direction. Hilda is a Netflix original series that aired in 2018 and is based on the comic by Luke Pearson. Hilda is a bit of an edge case where the overall style of the show is very much rooted in this style, but some elements of the comic books poke through. Couple this with a nice chill aesthetic with very comfy background art and you have a show that's rather unique but it's not doing anything that's super different. Victor and Valentino, a 2019 Cartoon Network original by Diego Molero. Honestly, this is another edge case. There is a lot of minute details in the show's style that set it apart from others, along with its Mesoamerican setting that really contrasts from the legion of shows that are set in the US suburbs. There's a lot of uniqueness in its environment design, there are some early concept art pieces of them, and it's almost a shame that they didn't make it to the end product because they're clearly pulling from like 80s anime and Studio Ghibli, whereas the main show is of course using this style. This tier is for shows that do something to stand out from the crowd by finding its own visual identity, but didn't influence the art movement either due to lack of popularity or simply because their style was made specifically for their show. In contrast against Trick Moon, the 2019 show by Parker Simmons, Mau Mau Heroes of Pure Heart really stands out in the character design department, really takes advantage of anthro character designs, especially with the main character. They designed Mau Mau to be an action hero that contrasts against the softer looking characters in the main cast. Also, they gave him and several other characters digitigrade legs, which are a challenge, but they help sell that they are anthros as opposed to funny animals. Sadly, the show was drowned out by non-stop Teen Titans Go on Cartoon Network and may or may not have a second season. 
Cartoon Network's been really quiet about it. I reviewed it back in 2019, so if you want more information on the show itself, go give that a look. OKKO OK Let's Be Heroes is a 2017 Cartoon Network original by Ian Jones Quirty, who previously worked on Steven Universe as a board artist and co-creator. OKKO OK leans into a more sketchy and cartoony style, using rougher line work and pushing expressions more than its predecessor did. The overall aesthetic is rooted in retrofuturism from the 80s and early 90s. There is also a lot of Mega Man inspiration from the main villains. It was slowly gaining traction and had quite a few specials during its runtime. But this was that era in Cartoon Network, so it never took off as earlier shows did, ending with only three seasons in 2019, while having to quickly wrap up all of its plot threads at the very end. Ah, the amazing world of Gumball. Yeah, this was a shoe-in for this category. It was the first show produced by Cartoon Network Studios Europe, created by Ben Broquette, and it ran from 2011 to 2019, which if we're going by the timeline would put it more in the iconic show category. But this particular show is too visually distinct to be such. This show's art style is a mix of 2D, 3D, and photography. Most of the 2D characters are actually animated in Flash, which is fairly rare for this era, while the 3D is done in Autodesk Maya to the surprise of nobody. The ability for Gumball to have so many disparate art styles in one show, yet maintain visual cohesion, is a very tall order, yet by skillfully compositing all the characters in photographic settings, it manages to ground them all. Supposedly it's going to get a movie soon, but that's been a few years. I don't know how long it's going to take, if at all. Another one that mixes styles is Centaur World, which I reviewed the first season of in this video over here. It was released in late 2021 on Netflix and was created by Megan Nicole Dong. This time it uses style to represent not only two worlds, but also character personalities. It actually used two different animation studios for each world, though when the Centaur World characters are done by Red Dog, they lose the squash and stretch that the Canadian studio does. That and, let's be honest, Season 2 Episode 2 is just, uh... I didn't like that episode, but that, those are my two gripes about it. The rest of it's great. Go see it if you haven't. I almost feel like I'm cheating with Kid Cosmic. It was a 2021 Netflix series created by Craig McCracken and developed with Lauren Faust and Francisco Agnonis. While Craig and Lauren are more associated with the Neo-Hanna-Barbera style of the late 90s and early 2000s, the character designs of Kid Cosmic's main cast definitely lean towards the Bean Mouth style. Then there is the rest of the art direction. The line work is rough and the backgrounds are rendered like Silver Age comic books, which give it a very distinct art direction. Another show I'd highly recommend for its storytelling and its art style. Hayapka, the Nympha de Mano story, is a 2020 Filipino animated film for Netflix that is another rare example of adult animation that uses this style. Rather than use lines, it prefers to go entirely with lineless shapes. Combine that aspect with the visual shakeup that Anthro characters can bring, and you have a film that really stands out from a lot of other 2D animated works. Bee and Puppy Cat is a web series created by Natasha Alighieri. I hope I pronounced that right. Its pilot was released in 2013 on Channel Frederator's YouTube channel. Then it aired its first season in 2016 on Verve. While a lot of its predecessors like Steven Universe do draw an anime in some sense, Bee and Puppy Cat is saturated in shoujo anime influences, combining it with the character design philosophy of this art movement. This is one of the cases where it's part of a larger trend in this art style, but it clearly didn't have the same amount of impact that others did because of how obscure it was. Supposedly it's going to get another season on Netflix and hopefully that'll make it a bit more popular, but we haven't heard much about it in the time being, so as far as I know, it's on hiatus. Amphibia is a 2019 Disney Channel original created by Matt Bradley. While not the biggest shift away from the main hallmarks of this art movement, it's clearly moving away from it. The human characters have more rounded heads, eschewing the old bean shape used to define the upper and lower head. Then there are the frog characters who kind of resemble animated puppets, which is a very interesting take. 
I've not seen much of it beyond clips, but it does seem to be structured like Gravity Falls in order to avoid the dreaded Disney XD curse and end on its own terms. I'm not even sure this one counts as being in this style, but I'll throw it in anyways. Nico and the Sword of Light was an Amazon Prime series that ran from 2017 to 2019. It was based on a comic by Bobby Chu and Kay Asadera. The show's style could best be described as taking the Bead Mouth style, adding a hefty amount of Cartoon Saloon into it, then giving it the animation quality of an Ankama production, which is just chef's kiss. Unfortunately, all the Bezos bucks in the world couldn't buy it more viewers because Amazon Prime wasn't as big a name back in 2017. So unfortunately, this is where Nico is going to stay. These are the shows that used some variation of this art movement and ultimately suffered through it, either because it was a poor fit or because it just wasn't used particularly well. Undercats Roar, a 2020 Cartoon Network series developed by Victor Courtright and Marley Halper Grazer. It mainly uses Victor style, which is actually rather unique. It probably would have done well for a series that's more surreal and possibly on Adult Swim. However, Thundercats as a franchise is rooted in both Western comic books and Japanese anime, with the original being animated by the Pacific Animation Corporation that worked on The Last Unicorn, and the 2011 version being animated by Studio 4C. The more cartoony style and denser tone was not well received in its 2018 reveal. The series was then quietly released in 2020 on the Cartoon Network site, where it lasted for one season. The style and direction for the reboot was not a good fit at all, and it really began the criticism towards this particular art movement. A similar but ultimately more downplayed instance was the 2016 reboot of Ben 10, which eschewed the anime-influenced style of prior iterations for one that was more influenced by modern cartoons, which turned off a lot of fans to the series. Though it did manage to handle itself well, running for four seasons, and apparently still managed to keep a tone that was a lot more like its first version. Sadly, it was passed over by a lot of people because it did not resemble its predecessor's visuals. Ah yes, the 2016 reboot of the Powerpuff Girls. I did a video on this one, so I'll try to keep it brief. Try. The original show style is what I call Neo Hanna-Barbera, which used thick lines and a combination of rounded and sharp edges to describe characters, much like Hanna-Barbera cartoons that creators like Craig McCracken grew up with. The old show mainly used this style for everyone, save for the girls who were completely rounded, because they are artificial. So now that the art style of everyone else is different, there is no longer a visual cohesion between old characters and new. Then there were the stale memes, the recasted voice actresses, Bellum being cut, and of course the fourth Powerpuff Girl. It was ultimately a rather average show that was held back by several creative decisions. Real pity. Sanjay and Craig, a 2013 Nickelodeon show made by Jim Dershberger, Andreas Trolf, and Jay Howell. Honestly, I wasn't even sure if this would be on the list because of how different the style is. In all honesty, it feels like something that came out of the gross-out era of the 90s and early 2000s. It was canned after three seasons. Pickle and Peanut a 2015 Disney XD show by Noah Z. Jones and Joel Trussell. It's a lot like Sanjay and Craig, but in this case, they used some mixed media with it. Again, it's like 90s gross-out show humor with a 2010s coat of paint. Sadly, it really got better in the second season, but wasn't enough before it got canned, because again, Disney XD is kind of a graveyard for shows. There is one that hasn't come out at the time of writing, but it's already got one major issue with its art. My Little Pony Tell Your Tale is a series of five minute YouTube videos that tie into the fifth generation of My Little Pony. This seems much like the Toucan Sam incident, where one of the higher ups deliberately wanted the art style to look like this. Anatomy be damned. The bodies of these characters look fine and are actually rather distinct from one another. 
However, the big problem is that these are human jaws and human mouths on non-human characters. I am willing to bet there were designs that were more like either the G4 or G5 main designs, but got changed to appeal to young kids, or at least as the execs wanted them to look. Ultimately, it doesn't work because, again, these head shapes are shorthand for human heads, not horse heads. It should have been a little bit different and also make the mouths connect with the snouts because that that's how snouts work. A little bit of anatomy goes a long way in this style because there are so few details that these little changes matter. This tier is specifically for the shows by creators who have an established voice and style in this art movement, so we'll quickly go over this section based off of their creator. Pendleton Ward notably created the 2012 web series Bravest Warriors, which ran on and off for four seasons on several different platforms. He was also behind the 2020 Netflix animated series The Midnight Gospel, which is even more trippy than his earlier work and is very much an adult series. J.G. Quintel also went on to make Close Enough, a 2020 HBO Max adult animated series, it's kind of a spiritual successor to regular show in a sense, especially because one of the main characters is voiced by the same person who voiced Mordecai. C.H. Greenblatt also created Harvey Beaks, which aired on Nickelodeon from 2015 to 2017. Victor Courtright went on to direct Aquaman in 2021 for Cartoon Network. I've heard it's been better received than Thundercats Roar, so good on him, I guess. This tier is for the shows that are pushing this style forward. They aren't just simply unique, but ones that could be seen as natural evolutions of this style and could pave the way for a new movement entirely. I'm going to be completely honest. I've only seen clips of Infinity Train, so I can't really speak on its story. Thankfully, that means I can solely focus on the who and what of its art. Infinity Train is a HBO Max show that ran from 2019 to 2021 that was created by Owen Dennis, who attended the Minneapolis College of Art and Design and had previously worked on regular show as a writer and storyboard artist. Looking at how the human characters are handled, we see a major break from other shows on this list. There is a greater focus on anatomy and form. Characters aren't purely simplified forms. They actually have creases in their clothing and are more detailed in general. Overall, the style feels more like a small indie comic, and I quite like that. The series also seems to cater towards an older demographic as well, so if other shows want to appeal to that audience, they might do well to look at this particular show. Glitch Tex is a 2019 Nickelodeon show turned Netflix series that was created by Danny Milano, who worked on Robot Chicken, and Eric Robles, who is also known for making Fanboy and Chum Chum. Much like the previous entry on this list, the characters of Glitch Tex are more intricate, but this one draws from action shows of the mid to late 2000s. Pity it only ran for two seasons on uh, Netflix, which ended with a cliffhanger. Nick really dropped the ball on this one. The Ghost and Molly McGee is a 2021 Disney Channel original by Bill Motz and Bob Roth. This is another one that I've only viewed clips from, yet from what I've seen, it looks like a very solid show. This show's style definitely goes a route that I can see other cartoons take. There are a lot of minute changes in how these characters are made that add up to quite a bit. The heads are more elliptical, the limbs of the characters taper either inwards or outwards at the hands. Also, ubiquitous eyelashes. Normally when eyelashes are this pronounced, they're pulling from anime, but this still reads as a very western take on eyeballs. They're a lot more simplified in form compared to the earlier entries, but again, there is a very strong sense of structure in these designs. While not the biggest departure from the wider style, I can definitely see this as a way to move forward while still appeasing the suits who want it to look modern or appealing. The Owl House is a 2020 Disney Channel fantasy show created by fellow Connecticut kid Dana Terrace, who attended the School of Visual Arts in New York. When it comes to character designs, it takes the more anatomical approach that Rebecca Sugar did with her Steven Universe sketches and fully applies it to the show. There is also a bit of anime influence in it as well mainly in how they handle eyes and hair. 
The backgrounds are another story altogether. First of all, we have Steven Sugar as the lead background designer. In addition, the crew took influence from artists like John Bauer, Arana Misbosh, and Rakshin Architecture to create a distinct setting and visual style that really sets it apart from the crowd. I'd like to talk about it more, but I'd rather save that for a retrospective once the series ends. After going through this list, it's given me a bit more insight on the advantages and disadvantages of this style. Yes, as before, it's easier to draw. Expressions can be pushed further, and the emphasis on simple character design allows for the production team to meet the all-too-often short deadlines of their shows. However, using this style is like broth in a soup. It tastes like what you put into it. The standout shows in this art movement tend to have a clear visual identity by having a distinct tone and drawing from influences beyond their peers and predecessors. If it's made to look too much like pre-existing shows, it's going to get lost in the crowd. Then there are the reboots and adaptations that bring their own artistic baggage. Generally, if you're going to apply this style to an older IP, you're gonna have some issues if you don't evoke the source material enough. Even if this style is what gets shows greenlit, there is room to make it stand out. Unfortunately, what seems to be the best way to do that is by having the show's visual style figured out far before pitching it to studios, and then hoping they don't change it once it's greenlit. Judging by some of the newer works, we are starting to see art styles that lean into one aspect of the movement or dip away from the more conventional look of modern cartoons. Heck, ever since streaming sites began picking up steam, we're starting to see shows that are part of a different animation movement entirely. In any case, I'm looking forward for what the 2020s have in store for us. I'll be seeing you all next time on Design Dungeon.